Greetings to all in the love and light of the one infinite creator. My name is Jonathan Tong and I'm facilitator for the Seattle Law of One study group. We can be found in the list of study groups on the LNL research webpage shown on your screen. We can also be found on Facebook. We do uh, meet on Zoom twice a week at the time shown on your screen. And if you contact us at the email address shown on your screen, that would be a great way to sign up for our Zoom sessions or to sign up for our monthly Q and A's with Jim McCarty and members of the LNL channeling team that we do once a month. Uh, you don't have to live in Seattle or anywhere near Seattle to join our Facebook group or to join our Zoom meetings. Anyone who's interested and available is welcome to join. We also have a YouTube channel where we keep recordings of previous Q and A's with Jim and Austin, Trish and Gary from the LNL Research Channeling team. Feel free to check that out for recordings of previous sessions. If you click on any individual link, you'll see below a list of topics and timestamps and encourage you to go through and browse and see if you can find anything that is of interest to you at that time. Otherwise, uh, today we are once again blessed to be joined by Mr. Jim McCarty for some informal conversation questions and answers about the law of one and how to live in our daily lives. How are you doing today, Jim? Doing very well. It's another great day in Louisville, Kentucky. Got some rain coming down for my flowers. And uh, I've already been out there doing a little bit of weeding this morning. And Super so, exciting. Yeah. Getting ready for homecoming coming up at the end of this month, correct? Yes, that's the deal. This will be the second one we've had in May. We usually had them in uh, September, Labor Day weekend. But uh, this helps our staff to spread out the various gatherings you know, around the country and, and Prague and Berlin as well. Nice. Yes, much appreciation. Deep thanks to uh, Trisha Bean and Gary Bean for all their roles and, and Austin Bridges as well for their help in uh, facilitating and organizing and setting up all of these meetings. Uh, anyone who is interested, I believe all three of those gatherings have been sold out at this point, but I leave, believe they do have a waiting list set up and people do cancel. So if you are interested in attending the uh, homecoming event in Kentucky or the Pacific Northwest event in uh, uh, near Seattle at the end of June or the Philadelphia event, uh, coming up on the East Coast, I believe in August, uh, or the Prague event <laughs> coming up in Europe. Uh, go to the LNL Research website and go to events and you can find details on all of those. Otherwise, uh, yeah, Jim, as always, wanted to thank you so much for, for being here and taking time to answer questions. I did have a couple questions that I wanted to ask to start with, and I'll encourage anyone who's here on Zoom call, if you have a question to ask, please uh, go ahead and type it in the chat window and we will go in the order that they are there. Uh, Jim, I had uh, one question. Well, first of all, I, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, you have a birthday coming up fairly soon in less than a week. Am I remembering correctly <laughs> that May 10th is the anniversary of your incarnation this time around? You got it. <laughs> wow. And is it 77? Is that correct? Is that the age you will be officially? Two sevens. Uh, that, I think, is probably my favorite number because it was Carla's favorite number. She was born in July 7, 16th, 7, 1943, 7. So I feel like I have a connection with her now, more strongly than usual, or I will have shortly. <laughs> oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I was going to ask if the number 77 had any special meaning to you. What a delightful thing. Do you have any other thoughts, reflections at this stage point in your incarnation? I believe age is a state of mind. I don't feel 77. <laughs> That's an old guy. <laughs> you don't look 77, bro. <laughs> For sure. You are uh, timeless and forever young, eternally young, it appears, in spirit and body. Uh, I had one other question for you, and that was uh, in our Seattle group. We had a discussion a few days ago on the subject of inner and outer planes, and it's something that I think it would be fair to say all of us, myself included, are not all that clear on what exactly is the difference between inner and outer planes and whether Kuo or Ra are in the inner planes or outer planes or both. Would you mind sharing for folks here and, and watching, what, what's your take on inner outer planes? 
Well, we live in the outer planes here in the third density illusion. And we come from the inner planes when we make our, our pre-incarnated choices. The inner planes are the metaphysical planes. The outer planes are the physical planes. So when we're in the inner planes, we have the whole picture of the nature of creation being that of unity and love and light. But we want to learn lessons that uh, would be more valuable if they were learned through the veil of forgetting in the outer planes where we are now. So we make those programs so that we can learn in this confused situation of the third density illusion where everything's seemingly separate, every body and everything from each other. The total unity of creation is not obvious. So that's why learning lessons here makes so much more difference. It carries more weight in the total beingness, as Ra said. So the, the outer planes are physical, inner planes are metaphysical or spiritual. Of course, we try to be spiritual here in the, the outer planes as well. That's, that's our great journey. Indeed. Thank you. Yes, yes, I believe that definitely uh, makes more sense. Do you have a sense for whether Kuo and or Ra, Latui, Hatan, are they in the outer planes, inner planes, both? Well, I believe, and I could be wrong, that uh, they're in the inner planes and they communicate through the inner planes to us by a connection uh, that's telepathic. They can penetrate the illusion and help us to receive concepts that are beyond this illusion to help us understand more about the illusion. Although Ra really did not like using the word understand because this density is not the density of understanding. So maybe I should use the word attempt to grasp. <laughs> I, know. I like how they always <laughs> say understanding for lack of a better word. Yeah. Yeah. If we may use this misnomer. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, it would be fair to say that Ra had a third, fourth density existence on the planet we know as Venus in the outer planes, correct? And right. do you have a sense for where Ra as a sixth density entity resides, if not <laughs> in Venus? Well, I think I know, but they never said. They said they left Venus, and Don asked, well, why did you leave Venus? We wish to be of service. So all fourth density through sixth density beings can go to the sun and become residents there in one function or another. And what I believe Ra has done is gone to the sun. So in another place, they mentioned that uh, sixth density, um, what we would call sexual experiences uh, are total fusion and they produce the light of the sun. And of course, the Egyptians worshiped them with the gods of the sun, which was not exactly what Ra had in mind. And that's one of the distortions they felt they needed to try to correct or balance after they're walking among the Egyptians and were worshiped as gods. Uh, so I believe they're probably on the sun and, and shining their love and light at us uh, every moment and giving this earth uh, life and the mother earth receives it and uh, is a, appreciative and produces all kinds of life forms here on, on this planet. I appreciate your saying that because that thought has crossed my mind more than a few times as well, especially as you said, since the Egyptian god Ra was associated with the, the sun. And what a beautiful thing to look up in the sky and see the sun <laughs> and think, there's Ra. If you've ever wondered where Ra is, they're <laughs> as close as the sun. What a beautiful thing to, to be told and to uh, contemplate. I had one last question before we go to the uh, chat window, uh, and this is sort of a follow up. Would it be fair to say that the outer planes then correlate with space time and the inner planes with time space? Yes. And then What's your take on time, space, and space time? More or less the same as inner outer planes, or what's the difference, shall we say? Well, we're here in space time. We can, we're pretty much stuck in time. Time moves very slowly here, but we can move around in space, in our space time environment. 
in time space in the inner planes, then they can move in time, but they're kind of stuck in space. Yes, I remember the analogy where they said space time, uh, there's a mismatch in space time that favors space where right. space is like a field and time is like a river running through a field. Whereas in time space, the opposite is true. The mismatch favors time. So time is a field and space is more like a river running through the field. Right. What's your take on that? How, 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 how do you interpret that? What does that mean to you? Well, uh, I think that basically the nature of reality is uh, the ever-present moment that there is no time. So in the eternal present, everything is happening at once. But we can't grasp that in our reality here. We have to take things sequentially and move in time uh, to the best of our ability. The more ability to move in space as we move through our daily round of activities. So we're flexible as far as uh, moving in space. We're not so flexible in time. Thank you. Yeah, that was something that I had wondered about. It seems like I have experienced something like the present moment on more than a few occasions, or it's mm -hmm. at least something close to being a present moment. And it did feel like time was eternity at that point. It was almost like time had stopped and space was a little bit more fluid, but those moments have been few and far between and fleeting <laughs> at best. So, well, thank you so much for uh, the enlightenment and I am looking forward to going back <laughs> and listening to this again to contemplate further. But I know there are people who came here to ask some questions too. So I believe Anat, uh, uh, Ishan was first in the list and then Renat and then Linda and we'll go from there. Ishan, would you like to unmute your mic and ask a question? Hello, Jim. Hello, John. Yeah. Nice, to have, you. nice to have your presence. It's a blessing for us all. One of the purest embodiment of love. So my question here would be regarding uh, the channelings from other beings and entities, uh, specifically Quetzal Court, if you have heard of. Uh, there is Anika from the Chicago uh, Law of One group, and you know, she started channeling uh, this uh, entity, Quetzal Court. So in the raw contact, they also mentioned like uh, the other peoples were from Confederation uh, who went to South America, and at those times, uh, so they definitely correlate with those uh, Quetzal Court, the second social memory complex on Venus. So I would like to know your views on you know those other entities who are getting channeled. And uh, specifically of this Quetzal Court, uh, how you know this generation of spiritual seekers are uh, being able to channel uh, higher density beings, and how this is you know leveling up the love and light of this planet. What's your views and your feelings on this? Well, I was in communication with Annika Kearney uh, before I really knew much about Quetzalcoatl. Uh, if you look up Quetzalcoatl, they are considered the uh, gods of the Aztecs and the Mayans in South America. And Ra did say that they divided their forces to move into that area to try to share the love and light of the creator as they had attempted to do with the Egyptians. So the message that I first received from Annika that was actually from Quetzalcoatl, uh, struck me as something that was very possible that they could be, as they said they were, confederation of uh, entities of the confederation of planets in the service of the infinite creator. And they had come to share their, their love and light with planet Earth. And I think that uh, it is a possibility that uh, they could be what they say they are. And I think it would be a, an amazing thing, a beautiful thing, to have more communication from the Confederation of Planets, uh, from another sixth density entity. Um, I know that uh, 
they are attempting to get together a group uh, from the Chicago uh, Hartman Log One Study Group that will work with Annika and have these channelings, uh, I believe once a month is what they have in mind. And I also know that she's able to uh, give free readings to people uh, and communicate with their guides. And I have a friend that got one of those readings and she thought it was just an amazing reading. So overall, I have a very positive feeling about it. I guess uh, all I can say is time will tell as to what the future uh, channelings have to say and whether uh, they will have congruence with uh, what Raw had to say. And I'm really looking forward to it. Nice. Thank you for your views. Uh, I also had that session with Anika about, you know, with my guidance system. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I really resonated with that. I had that first time, you know, psychic, uh, you know, contact with my guidance system. And it really resonated very much. And I uh, want to express my feelings of excitement regarding this contact, the schedule code. I'm looking forward to the amazing content that we just have to receive in this love and light and blessing. Yes, Thank you yes. for your views. Thank you for your question. Thank you for sharing that, Ashan. Feel free to share that contact information in the chat window with folks here on the Zoom call or in the comment section of the YouTube video when it comes out. Okay, great. And I did want to encourage folks to uh, let you know there are a lot of wonderful Law of One study groups out there all over the country, all over the world. And again, if you go to the uh, LNL Research website, go up to the Connect link, I believe, at the top of the page, and you'll see a list of study groups and how to contact from all over. Speaking of which, I believe we have a follow-up question from Josh. Do you have a question, Josh, you'd like to ask? Follow-up? Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, Follow-up question, what are your thoughts on how Annika is channeling, conscious channeling a sixth density entity since we know in order for Carla to have the narrow band contact required the trance and a lot of uh, preparatory work. Any thoughts on sixth density conscious channeling? Um, not at this time. I. Uh, I know that when Carla first started her channeling, uh, that resulted in the beginning of the raw contact. She was in a conscious channeling group teaching. She and Don were teaching a student uh, how to channel. And so it began channeling, but then uh, I'm not sure that, I mean, it sounds exactly like all the rest of the channel, the first one, like all the 106 sessions but I'm not sure if she left her body then and was in that type of trance. And I'm not sure if uh, Annika will evolve into a deeper consciousness that would approach trance. I think it's a process in work. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, anything's possible. I, I, from what little I know right now, I just, uh, I, I couldn't say um, what the fact is that she began conscious channeling because it, it could change. That's a great question, Josh. Did you have any follow-ups on that? Uh, no, that's all. Thank you so much. We'll wait and see. Thank you, Thank you Josh. Josh Silverman, uh, by the way, facilitates a reading, the Law of One uh, study group that meets on Wednesdays, I believe. And uh, they read through the rock contact together and have great discussion. So again, I encourage you to check out the uh, list of study groups on the Eleanor Research website and see if you can connect. Uh, otherwise, I see Renat had a question. Renat, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, Jim, I have uh, a question about the pronunciation of the word, the last word, um, greeting, in the greeting. Um, you, and actually you, Jonathan, as well, uh, pronounced it as Adonai. And uh, I wonder why you do that. Is that how it came through uh, Carla? Because in Hebrew, we would pronounce it differently. Adonai would mean something else. We pronounce it Adonai. So, you know, maybe it's something technical, but I feel that this is the crescendo of the greeting and it's an important word. So I was just, just wanted to raise this question. Yes, I'm familiar with uh, the... Hebrew pronunciation of Adonai. The reason I say Adonai is because that's what Ra said. 
if you go to our website and go to uh, channeling the raw contact in the original audios uh, you can listen to Carla channeling raw while looking at the words she's channeling it's a very uh, beautiful experience but they always said Adonai so if they can say Adonai I'll say Adonai <laughs> That's a great question, Rana. Uh, so what is the meaning of Adonai? In Adonai, so, so the word Adonai, in Hebrew, there's like, Hebrew is much more concise than English. <clears throat> um, so Adonai means my Lord or my master, and Adonai would mean something else. First of all, it turns into plural. Uh, so it would be the Lords or the masters of. So it would be the Lord or the masters of, and there's like, you know, you can attribute to whatever you want. So, yeah, I was wondering about that. I, I tried, uh, Nili and I tried to listen to the, to the word yesterday and we, we didn't manage to, to get to that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you for asking and thank you for sharing the teach learning. Uh, Linda, and then we've got Michael, Neely, and Ramon after that. Hey, Jim, how you doing today? Morris hey, sends his greetings. He's out on the back 40 doing work again. <laughs> uh, so uh, just well, got a quick question. This is regarding earth healings. Uh, I had been doing some potentially depolarizing when I was bringing people like Putin and Trump and everything into my earth healings. And so I, of course, dropped that off. I was wondering if since the land of the Middle East and the land of around Russia through has been through millennia of conflict, I'm now trying to draw the trauma up out of these places, visualize the trauma being drawn up and then transmuted into peace, love and light um, with angelic and confederation assistance. Is this depolarizing? I was thinking since earth isn't exactly, it's still first density, I might be okay, but I'm not, I don't want to cause problems. I don't think that anything that you have done, even with Putin and Trump, is depolarizing if your intention is to send them love and light and healing energies to them and to the areas that they exist in, to any area that has war or separation from whatever cause. Uh, I think it's the intention that is what you build the entire effort to heal upon. So uh, I don't think you have any, any problems there. Just, you know, keep on sending love and light. Uh, I would suggest, well, if I were doing it, and this is just me, I would feel the creator's love moving through me to right. them and not uh, my own, because I'm limited. <laughs> Unless, of course, I opened up enough so the creators let them flow through me all the time and that would be the ideal but i think that's the thing to do is to uh, set your intention to let the creators love flow through your heart and uh, to the places where in the people where it's needed okay so by by drawing things out of the earth uh negative things potentially conflict hate anger I'm, it's not causing any problems I don't believe so. Actually, I think that uh, Mother Earth is a place where a lot of those uh, difficult vibrations can be absorbed and she can handle them uh, because she's got so much, you know, of love and so much of the creator within her. That I think that uh, I think that's what happens when we, we like go barefoot outside, we're earthing. We're feeling that healing energy. And I think that it, it is coming to us from Mother Earth because she can absorb problems that we have. So uh, I think she's a, a good source of healing too. So you don't think that earthquakes and all the in, uh, volcanoes blowing and all that are not a result of Mother Earth releasing the negativity? Well, I do believe that's true too. Uh, for the thousands of years that there have been wars on our planet, uh, as Don discovered during the raw contact, uh, that has increased the amount of heat in the earth. And in order for Mother Earth to be able to blend her vibrations with the fourth 
uh, density vibrations that are continuing to engulf the planet, that she needs to be able to slowly release those heat of anger and war vibrations in the forms of volcanoes and earthquakes and tidal waves, which if she did not do it as slowly in that form could be cataclysmic. So I think that she is doing a really great job there. But I think she's also able to absorb what we give her and maybe uh, do the same thing slowly and release it. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Thank you very much. I appreciate your insight. Thank you for your question. And I like your new hairstyle. I'll see, I'll see you in uh, May. <laughs> All right. And happy birthday. <laughs> well, thank you. Hey. Great questions, as always, Linda. Much appreciate it. It uh, makes a big difference, I believe, for all of us. Uh, Elaine has a follow-up question. Elaine. Yep. Oh, yep. Hi. Oh. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jim. Happy Hi. Uh, early birthday to <laughs> you. Um, this is a follow-up to Linda's question. So now, very recently, well, it hasn't been very recently, but much more attention is being brought upon the young people in the colleges and universities who are protesting um, for peace. Um, and as I watch this, I wonder, are these the, the third slash fourth density entities being born to come and help heal the planet and how conscious are they of 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 what they're doing in terms of um sending their 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 um intense desire for peace on the planet does well, that make any sense? Like, do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> well, I could have thoughts and I do have thoughts, but I don't know that they are uh, what uh, Carla and, and uh, other uh, Quo and so forth have called the uh, crystal uh, children, the indigo children, the duly activated bodies, entities. They could very well be uh, back in the beginning of the raw contact. There were only, uh, I think they said 15, 15 or 35,000 then. By now, there could be a great deal more. And I think that, you know, this is something that's uh, been repeated uh, from time to time in the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. Back when I was a hippie, we were demonstrating against the Vietnam War. And uh, eventually it was brought to an end partially because of the demonstrations. And I think that that is probably the great goal now of the demonstrations uh, throughout the country that are happening more and more frequently. And uh, and they're having various degrees of success that uh, they're uh, totally upsetting all the school administrators and the local police forces. Uh, and uh, you know, sometimes things have to be upset before they get set right. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how it goes. I mean, mm -hmm. I surely wish them the best in their efforts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great follow-up question. Thank you, Elaine. I believe we have Michael up next and then Neely and then Ramon. Hi, Jim. Uh, no, first, I just wanted to thank you for um, everything you've done over the past 40 plus years. Uh, I definitely want to say that. And, uh, you know, I, I was actually curious um, about which books, uh, maybe on the l, l research site that uh, you would recommend uh, on channeling just on beginning channeling or, or anything like that? Uh, Carla's A Channeling Handbook, I think, is a good place to begin. And then if uh, I think if you Google uh, channeling and uh, 2008 circle, uh, you'll come to the probably the, the best information that she had, to, Carla had to offer on channeling where she was training some people uh, to be channels and she goes through the entire process of uh, how to become a channel and uh, it's very extensive and uh, I think that that's that would probably be my uh, best recommendation as to uh, 
now, along with her channeling handbook. Thank you. Thank you a lot, John. Thank you for your question. Good reminder to anyone who's here or watching this that uh, if you go to the LNL research page and click on library, I think at the top, uh, everything that LNL research has done is available for purchase for folks who like to hold books in their hands or to read in that experience uh, that can be purchased there. And it's a nice way to support the organization as well. But they're also available for free in PDF form. The group has committed to making all of these spiritual teachings free for everybody and doesn't want money to keep anybody from being able to learn from that. So I encourage folks to check it out. Uh, thanks for your question, Michael. And uh, Neely, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Hi, Jim. Um, oh, I love your dog. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's a better image of the way I look right now, straight <laughs> out of bed with bed hair and PJs. <laughs> It'll have to do. <laughs> um, first, just to echo Michael's uh, sentiment, thank you. Just thank you. I always enjoy listening to your uh, point of view and teaches me a lot. Uh, the question that I have is, I would say more of the novice type. Uh, I've been um, practicing reading the law of one for about a year, a little over a year. And um, having been raised strictly atheist, um, there is no God. Uh, everything religious was kind of like poo-pooed in our house. And, and that's the way I grew up as well. So now that I'm really connecting, I've always believed in a God, in a creator, always, always somewhere. It, it, it's kind of like goes without saying, but I really find it hard to get into the practice of worship, devotion, um, all, all of those things. I, I find it really hard to take the first step. And I was wondering if you have any advice on how to get there. Well, um, what the Confederation of Planets in the Service of Infinite Creator has always recommended since the very first beginning channelings back in 1961 when Don got his group going uh, was that meditation is the way to find your spiritual journey and the way to feel the presence of a creator and the way to find your own unique path through the creator's presence, the love and the light and the unity that are the, the, the basic qualities of the universe, which is the creator. So I would recommend uh, maybe the meditation, uh, looking at uh, maybe some books that uh, could help you out. Uh, and I, I wouldn't know exactly what to recommend in the way of books that uh, worship precisely but maybe um, looking into that section in uh, a library or a, a library on the internet, uh, maybe coincidence would bring you to a book that would be something to consider. But mostly I would suggest uh, meditating and uh, letting that deeper mind, the mind of the creator, uh, funnel up into your intuition and let that be the arrow that points your direction. I think each of us is unique in whatever kind of worship we do, even if we've got one that is what well, you might say more traditional. You know, each of the major religions of the world have their mystical aspect. And that was basically what Carla was, was a mystical Christian. She didn't do dogma. You know, you know, most of the religions of the world have those two features, the dogmatic one where this and that is what you have to believe, and then the mystical one, which connects with the truer nature of reality, uh, living within the eternal present and feeling the presence of the creator. So I, meditation would be the first thing I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Quick. Any follow-up questions on that, Neely? It's a great question. Um, I need to ponder before I follow ups. <laughs> I know the feeling. 
Thank you for being here. Thank you for Thanks. asking your question. Uh, I do see Ramon next, followed by Hannah, followed by Aram. If there's anybody who put a question in the chat window and I haven't mentioned your name yet, then please let me know. I did my best to look through everything there. And if you still have other questions, we definitely have time for more questions after that. So feel free to put them in the chat window. Otherwise, uh, Ramon, you had a question you'd like to ask? Yes, uh, hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, much love and light. Uh, happy early uh, incarnation anniversary to Jim McCarty. Uh, much <laughs> love you. to all of you. And so, uh, again, thank you so much for all your service. And I have to mention this again two years ago, LNL Research uh, did a meditation for the peace in my community, which I think it worked at least for a week or two. So, thanks a lot for that. It means a lot to me. Uh, keep my community, Ciudad Miguel Le Man, in your hearts. We need peace. We need peace here in Mexico, please. Um, and so my question is related to education. My uh, my wife, uh, she recently, well, last year, she quit her job uh, back in Texas. We live right in the border. Uh, we live in the Mexican side. And um, she, she uh, started her own business uh, related to child education. More specifically, she helps uh, kids that are uh, having issues, you know, uh, transitioning from Spanish to English or uh, mm, having issues uh, getting, you know, with uh, reading comprehension and everything. So my question is, which method uh, does the people, uh, does the community in the LNL research and everyone, uh, Quo, Ryan, all these, uh, uh, all these friends we have, uh, what, is, what is the recommendation they give? What is the best method, you know, like, I, I don't know, Montessori or the, Waldorf, you know, uh, such as the Rolf Steiner method, which method or which way you would recommend for us as teachers, you know, not as parents, because we're not, <clears throat> we're not parents yet, as teachers, how can we uh, educate kids, not just teach them stuff, educate them, you know, do not violate their free will, uh, let them you know, come out from by themselves. Uh, that's my question. Well, as far as I know, we do not have a specific recommendation for how to do that. Uh, I have heard very good things about the Montessori school. Uh, when I was in teacher corps in Florida in 1972, we attempted to work with kids from the inner city areas that were uh, low income and to help them uh, there was a program in the United States then called Head Start, where they, before they were in uh, the first or second grade, they went in kindergarten and they, they got special instruction uh, and it didn't really hold. So they developed another program called Follow Through, which worked with grades one, two, and three. And at that time, we tried to individualize the education so that each student uh, could have their needs met uh, rather than everybody learning the same thing at the same time. Now that takes a lot more work because it, you have to be aware of what each student needs and then do your best to meet those needs. So, uh, and I think Montessori does a good job of that. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with any other general type of education. Uh, so, whatever you can do to just individualize the education and fit it to the needs of the students, uh, I think would be the most helpful you could do, but it will also be the most uh, labor intensive, I think, because it takes more work. Uh, it, it, is, it is, but it's actually what we're doing. Well, we're just having, you know, this small groups from four to eight, nine uh, students maximum. So that way she can focus on, on kids, oh. we're we're not here, we're not here just to make money. We're here to to help. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, we don't uh, we are not you know in a in a in any uh, issue. You know, we don't we don't need the money. We we need the we want the ser we we want the service. And just uh, as a quick follow up, uh, just a quick follow up. I re I love traveling. I know you don't you don't like traveling that much. You you like to stay in your house. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I I have a question. I don't know. I just love traveling i'm also a private pilot uh i, I guess I, I i kind of uh identify identify a lot with don uh do we do we get any activation or do we get any you know uh you know i don't know chakra activation or any past memories whenever we go to some places because i i i, I find i found that every time i i go you know like 
Egypt, uh, Indonesia, here in Mexico to the pyramids. You know, I, I started getting, you know, these weird dreams or, or feelings. And I don't know if it's just my imagination or we do activate and we get, you know, these energies and this information. We download this information from the places. That's uh, what I was wondering, if the places have some information that we can access it by just going there and do a quick meditation or just uh, showering with the energies from the place. Well, and just as my opinion, I think that that's very true. I think that locations can absorb the vibrations of uh, every person that's ever been there. And whatever work they did towards discovering their nature as the creator and sharing the love and light of the creator is imbued within the place, the pyramid or the, uh, the river, the mountains, you know, the forests, uh, locations more especially. So uh, I think maybe you have a special sensitivity to those places and they may be locations where you were in previous lives. And that's very likely what can happen to anybody who is very sensitive uh, in their own spiritual seeking. So I, I think that's beautiful. And uh, so I would, I would totally support that uh, and, and say that that's the way to go. Thank you so much, Jim, uh, again, for, for answering the questions and much love and light to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your question. Thank you for being here, Ramon, and much love. Continue love and light to your community and people and the beautiful country of Mexico and all people there. Uh, Hannah, I thanks a lot. You're, you're welcome. Thank you for being here. It's honored to have you with us. Hannah, would you like to unmute your mic and ask your question or questions? Yes. Thank you for having me and happy early birthday, Jim. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, the first one um, kind of has to do with infringing on the free will of children. Um, my question is, how do I discipline my children without infringing on their free will? My example is my five-year-old sometimes gets very upset. I offer her better, quote unquote, techniques of maybe dealing with her anger, but she usually cho chooses to throw her toys around. Then she gets happy again and then she, or calm again I guess I should say and then she's upset that she threw her toys around and it kills me to see her do this um is do you have any suggestions oh uh I wish I did uh, I have a hunch that she is living out pre-incarnated choices uh I had that kind of anger now and then when I was a kid, it lasted for 68 years, but it was finally resolved because it was a pre-incarnated choice. Uh, I think all you can do is follow your heart. And I know you're doing that. I mean, you're a mother, you, you really want the best for your child. And uh, just do, I don't know, uh, meditate to see if there's anything more that you could do, I think you're doing all that you can do uh, to suggest to her that, well, maybe that's not what you want to do. If you're breaking your toys, if you're feeling bad afterwards, think about it. You know, maybe you can have a conversation with her, see what she's feeling when she does that and see if there is a, a path you both can forge forward for her to take. At least give her a thought, plant a seed. Um, I think that's about the best I can do. I mean, that's a tough situation. Linda, did you have a follow-up question on that? I was wondering, in a case when you're dealing with a child, is it okay to ask your higher self to deal with the higher self of that child to help to resolve issues like that? I know when my mother was dying, her higher self was talking with her father's higher self trying to resolve all these issues before she passed on. Is it okay to do that with a child? Do you think? I would think it would be okay. I mean, uh, or I effective. Well, I don't know if it would be effective. I mean, it could well be. I've really never heard of that before, but I think it's a possibility. That's a great question, Linda. Thank you for asking. And uh, thank you for sharing that. Hannah, did you have a follow-up or did you have a second question you wanted to ask? Um, I guess just briefly in follow-up, thank you. I appreciate your guys' input. 
um, it's just really difficult, but I really appreciate that. Um, my second question has to do with setting intention before you offer yourself in service, I guess. So in the morning on my way to work, I try to like not meditate because I'm driving, but set myself in intention, right? And, but it seems like when the patients start arriving to get their treatments and all that, I go almost into default mode. And it's not that I'm not providing service and that I'm not happy to, it's just, I'm not consciously like in love, I'm giving you the service. I'm just almost in neutral. Does that matter? Or to what effect does it affect anything? I guess, do you understand what I'm trying to ask? Yes, uh, I think the setting of the intention is the important part of this. And the fact that you don't feel that you're in anything other than neutral. Uh, I think that when you're working like you were working to try to help so many people with difficulties, that you just sort of have to put it into a, a steady state gear so that you can get through the day. Because I, I know that that's also hard work. And the intention, I think, is the most important thing. And uh, every now and then you might just, uh, if you have a moment um, between patients, uh, sit down for maybe a, a minute's meditation, a minute's uh, re-energizing of the intention. And uh, sort of like a, a little extra food for the, the body. This is the spirit and the heart you're working on. And uh, just keep doing what you're doing. I think you're, you're doing a beautiful work. All right, that's a really great suggestion. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Great questions. Much appreciated. Yeah, I'm reminded Quo has said many times that love is the answer to every question. Love is the <laughs> answer solution to every problem. And finding the love in the moment, that is the challenge for all of us, I think. I appreciate yeah. your sharing that. Uh, we have Aram and then Andy, and I think we'll be wrapping up after that. Aram, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Jim. Good to see you. Good and to see you too. Happy early birthday. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, um, and thank you for being here as always. Um, so my question is um, regarding how specifically you work with your dreams. Um, I, I've i noticed that with my dreams, there's like a different quality to some of them. And I'm not sure, you know, which ones I should be paying attention to if there are certain dreams that are just, I don't know, like mental processing that I can ignore. Um, yeah, just, that's my question, I guess. How, how like to work with dreams better? Well, uh, I must tell you that uh, for a long, large part of my life, uh, since uh, I guess the early 70s, I worked a lot with dreams. And uh, up until the time, uh, about a year after Carla passed into larger life, I worked uh, with dreams uh, continuously. And uh, so when I was doing, and the reason I'm saying that in the past tense is that I, I got a message uh, about a year after Carla passed into larger life that my dream work was done. It was now time to focus on meditation. But when I worked with the dreams, I tried to give my subconscious mind the strong feeling that I had, that I wanted a message, that I wanted to, to have something given to me that would be of importance in my life. And so then I, uh, in those days, I kept uh, paper and pencil and a little flashlight with a sock over it so it wouldn't wake me up, but just enough I could see to write. So that I would wake up after the dream and write it down and then go back to sleep. And so sometimes I'd have one or two or three dreams to work with. And after a period of time, I, I was able to discover that, that for me, there was a certain dream language that may or may not apply to other people. I think once you work with the, your dreams enough, you get the feeling of what the language of your dreams is. And, and for me, if I was in any kind of an automobile or a plane or anything was moving and I was within it, that was my life path. And what happened while I was in that vehicle of whatever kind it was, was uh, a portion of the life path that was probably a pre-incarnated choice. And if I was in a house, uh, a building, that was my mind. And 
whatever was happening within that building was something that I should think about and something I should give my attention to and try to interpret it in a way that, that felt right using my intuition. And then if I saw any kind of a female, this was my, uh, the high priestess of the tarot, of my subconscious mind. And it was a very special experience. It was something that what, whatever was happening then with this female, whatever the relationship or the interaction was, was something that I should give a very great importance to. So those were the basics uh, of how I interpreted my dreams. And I think you and everybody else that works with dreams will be able to figure out uh, after a period of time just exactly what certain qualities signify and then uh, go on from there. And of course, writing your dreams down and keeping a journal is really important. Uh, after you wake up, I think that there is where you do the interpreting. Although you can do a good deal of that while you're writing the dream down, you get a feeling, uh, a message sometimes that uh, if you write that down, then that, that is probably the meaning of the dream. Otherwise, in other words, you can interpret what the dream means in a journal and, and keep that journal and review it from time to time because some, sometimes dreams repeat. And when dreams repeat, that's usually a, a sign it's a more important message. So uh, that would be my suggestion. Any follow-ups on that? Right. No follow-ups. That was that was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I just have I, I just have a quick follow-up about, about the dreams. Uh, uh, so sorry to interrupt. Uh, is uh, what's the difference between the dreams we have uh, when we sleep and those small visions or like a, a scenes, you know, like movie clips that we get when we meditate. You know, sometimes when I'm meditating and I, I just I don't know, I lose. It's not like I'm sleeping. I'm like half sleep, half awake. And I get these little scenes, you know, sometimes really random. Uh, <clears throat> what do those mean? Or are, do they have any meaning? Or is it just static in my brain? I think those are probably, this is my opinion, uh, the same as dreams. And can be treated the same as dreams and utilized by interpreting them and applying them to your spiritual journey. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I had the same uh, <clears throat> theory. theory that you know dreams speak in a certain language specifically to everyone so uh, you have to find out which language it is thank right. you so much yeah. thank you great questions and uh great teachings jim thank you for sharing that that is definitely something to ponder for anyone who wants to, to do dream work uh andy i believe you've got the last question would you like to unmute your mic and ask sure thank you jonathan um happy birthday jim um thank you to see you. My question's about um, dealing with catalyst and the balancing exercises. So like given that all things are catalyst, are you meant to also balance, you know, like the positive emotions like joy and happiness and, you know, compassion by trying to go the opposite way? And then with negative catalysts, I, what I find is like when I try to do the balancing exercises, I go deeper and deeper into the the negative emotion and I just allow it and then when I finally break through to the kind of more the lighter or the more sometimes it's not even light it's like a really intense love um it doesn't feel as strong and or as um it doesn't last as long as the process of being dragged down into the depths of despair so it sort of feels like, well, you know, is it really working or am I just going deeper and deeper into like a negative space? Um, what's your experience with the balancing exercises and dealing with catalysts? Well, I think that it's important to balance all of the catalyst, the, uh, the good and the bad and the happy and the sad that you experience uh, in your daily round of activities. Because what this is for is to help you discover that you are the same as the creator. You are the creator. You are a 360 degree being. You've got the positive and the negative and everything in between. Now, when you mentioned love, the feeling of love that came down then, I think that might be the product of the balancing. And that love would not need to be balanced. That's what we're all here to do, to learn to open our hearts in unconditional love. 
And if we can do that at least 51% of the time, then that's the way that we make the graduation. But otherwise, I'd say that everything that happens can be catalyst for growth and can uh, reveal to you more and more that you are the creator, that you, you are experiencing everything that the creator experiences. And that's the way the creator knows itself. That's the way that you can know yourself as the creator. Any follow-ups on that, Andy? Uh, yeah, so how do you how do you work with positive catalysts to, to help you polarize then? The uh, polarization, I think, is a process that we utilize uh, as a feature of our intentions, our desire. And that, I, I could be wrong about this, but I see that as being a different than balancing catalyst. I think that polarization is the spiritual journey that we're here to take. And if we utilize the catalyst of positive and negative experiences, then that gives us more of an ability to, to move forward on our service to others type of journey. And, and so I, I would say there is a distinction between polarization in consciousness and being of service to others and opening your heart in love and light to others. And then in balancing your daily round of activities, the catalyst that happens as you're just going through the day and experiencing one thing and another. So that at the end of the day, you take a look at that experience and you, you go through the balancing. But then the overall process is more of the desiring to be of service to others and opening your heart and love to them. I hope that made sense. Yes, yes, it did, I, I think. I mean, I find um, I, I'm at that stage where I'm dealing with the catalysts and I there are times where I think, well, you know, I'm too messed up dealing with the catalyst to be of any use to anyone. Um, really. So, uh, I was just kind of wondering, I suppose, if if this process of working my on myself can actually be useful for anyone other than myself. Well, I think I think it's a good thing to do at the end of the day, so that you don't have the feeling that you're good, you're too messed up to deal with anybody. I think that's why Ross suggested the end of the day is the time to do that. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great questions, Andy. Thank you for sharing them. And yeah, I, I know Cole has said many times that the best way to heal the planet is to heal ourselves. And I feel pretty sure doing that inner work and cleaning yourself is definitely helping everyone. I appreciate you doing that, uh, in my opinion, at least which nobody asked for. Uh, we are <laughs> out of time, but I wanted to thank you for your questions. And I want to thank everyone here for the questions that you brought. These sessions are only as good as the questions that uh, people bring in. Your questions have been great, and it has been a great uh, session. But uh, Jim, as you know, we have one more thing to, to do. Uh, it is your birthday, and in honor of that, we do have a special uh, gift for you, and that is a pop quiz, of course. <laughs> Pop quizzes. Once again, uh, we have invited you here to test your knowledge of pop culture and to add a little bit of laughter and levity to our otherwise serious discussions about spiritual growth and evolution. The points, of course, don't matter. Uh, if you had fun, you won. And hopefully you'll have fun today. <laughs> Are you ready to begin? I'm ready. All right. Well, obviously, you know a lot about LNL research, but how much have you researched LOL, one of the most common tech thing abbreviations <laughs> used by third density uh, Earth entities of all ages. Are you familiar with this uh, abbreviation? Do you know what it means? Laugh out loud. Yes, indeed it does. So I'm going to ask you three multiple choice questions about this well-known text abbreviation. See how many you can guess correctly. Those of you here on the Zoom call, feel free to put your answers in the chat window if you want. Those of you still watching on YouTube, feel free to say your answers out loud and test yourself. Your first question, Jim. LOL was accepted into the Oxford English Dictionary in what year? Was it A, 1991, B, 2001, or C, 2011? 
I'll go with C. Nice. You are correct. Yeah. Surprisingly, I would have thought it would be uh, sooner than that, but it was 2011. I believe texting itself started sometime in the early 90s, so this was about 20 years later. Do you remember much of what happened in 2011? I don't even remember what I was doing yesterday. <laughs> uh, I remember a few things about 2011, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, probably the first thing that comes to my mind, it was just before 2012, which was kind of a big deal for a lot of people. And I know discussion of uh, mm -hmm. source of much discussion in the uh, channeling sessions uh, for folks who are not real familiar with this. Do you have any thoughts to share, particularly uh, looking back in hindsight on the year 2012 and the meaning that was given to it before that year and perhaps the meaning of it now looking back in hindsight? Well, that was a year that I believe uh, that many channels uh, felt that there was going to be a shift in the consciousness of the planet. And Carla had an idea along that same line, although she felt that it was a shift that was going to be happening in the, what we were talking about earlier, the time space portion, the inner planes. And it wouldn't necessarily manifest in an easily understood or recognized way in the space time. Interesting. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I'm looking at how much the world has changed since 2012. I'd say, yes, there was something for, for sure that has happened and is continuing. Let's try your next question. Which of these is not an actual variation of LOL from other countries? Is it A, 555 from Thailand, B, MDR from France, or C, H from Denmark? Go with B. Good guess. The correct answer uh, is in fact uh, C. 555 <laughs> five, five is used in Thailand because the number five in Thai language is pronounced ha. So 555 five, five is kind of like ha ha ha. Uh, MDR in France is the abbreviation for more than you, which translates as dying from laughter. And in Denmark, uh, the letter G is actually used for LOL instead of H. G would be an abbreviation of the word Grina, I believe, which means laughing in Danish. Interesting, though, how laughing and smiling seems to be a common universal thing for all people. Do you have any things in particular that make you laugh? Do you watch anything or listen to anything particularly for comedic purposes? Uh, no, I don't watch TV or listen to any radios or anything. Uh, I talk to myself a lot and sometimes I crack <laughs> myself up. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. That was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Surprising how many times we crack ourselves up. All right. Are you ready for the last question? I'm ready. Which of these is not actually used in the US as a variation of LOL? Is it A, PMSL for <laughs> pissing myself laughing? Is it B, ROFL copter for rolling on the floor, laughing, turning like a helicopter? Or is it C, uh, a long combination of word letters I will not bother reading, but stand for laughing my ass off, rolling on the floor, biting the carpet, scaring the cat, nearly dying by falling out of the window in front of a guy who looks like Bill Gates, who then horrified, runs out on the street and is accidentally killed by a yellow bulldozer. Which of those is not actually used in the US? as a variation of LOL. A. A is good guess. Uh, the correct <laughs> answer is none. <laughs> none of the above. They're all actual variations of LOL, including the well, last then, one. Then I couldn't have gotten that right. <laughs> Unless you guess none of the above, because that is always an unspoken. Well, then I have to keep that one in mind for the future. <laughs> <laughs> There's no rules to this, like I said, and the points of words don't matter. Yeah. Uh, it is interesting noting, this is uh, supposedly one of the longest uh, internet abbreviations. And no I, kidding. <laughs> the funny part is it's supposed to be used only when you are actually laughing at something as opposed to all the other times when you use LOL. <laughs> Once again, Mr. McCarty, it has been a joy uh, sharing this time with you and sharing a couple of laughs with you. Much appreciate <laughs> everything you do. And yes, we all, I think, wish you a very, very happy birthday to come and a very, very special 77 year. And uh, thank you for everything you've done and continue to do. Did you have any uh, last thoughts, reflections, want to share before we say goodbye? Well, 
thank you all for your birthday wishes. I appreciate that a lot. And I especially appreciate the, uh, the love that is in all your questions. Today seemed to be so full of love. It was like a, a web of love. We were all weaving it together and we're surrounded by it. And I just feel so loved and so appreciated. And I send you my love back. And I hope that you all have a great day. I hope your life journey goes forward into the love and light of the creator. That's where we're all headed together. That's our journey that we take as one, the one infinite creator. Okay. And we thank you so much for being part of our journey and letting us be part of yours. Love you very much, my friend. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to all our friends uh, at LML Research for all you've done and continue to do in service to others. Thank you for everyone who came to the Zoom call today. I'm adding your vibrations and your love as well for all you've done, continue to do in service to others. And for everyone who's watching on this YouTube at some later place in space, time, time, space. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all you've done, continue to do in service to others. Until next time, in the love and light of the one and creator. I don't know. Namaste. I don't know. Thanks, Jim. Oh, love you hey. so much, Jim. Happy thank birthday. You. Happy solar return. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I love you all. Much, you. much love. Thank you. Happy birthday. Bye. Happy birthday, John. Thank you.